and they they just published the uh, second study or the second part of their their first study. Um, they expect to do some additional work, not necessarily immediately, but maybe a couple of years down the road, um, looking at the work that they've already done as sort of a first look and then follow up uh, later. In any event, in any event, I just wanted to briefly highlight a couple of things that are in the study. Um, if people want to see the study or just look at the executive summary, it is uh, on the UMass Donahue Institute website uh, under the title Greater Springfield Housing Report uh, Releases Second Study. I actually think I sent it, put it in a note for everybody too. And Eric is nodding her head saying, yeah, I did that. That's good. Sometimes I don't know. I think I'm going to do something and then it doesn't happen. Um, there were some interesting highlights to the study, which I will uh, briefly read and then have one comment of my own on them. Uh, the first highlight is the Pioneer Valley has serious affordability issues and it can be addressed. That's the optimistic side. They talk about there being a mismatch between the availability of rental housing and its cost. Basically, the cost is too high. Uh, and they said or concluded that about 17,000 more rental units at or below $500 a month is needed. And they also say this is possible with federal and state funds flowing into the Pioneer Valley to help with recovery. So that's optimistic. Um, they also point out that COVID-19 made the housing situation harder. I'm sure everybody's aware of that, particularly for those already in difficult economic positions. Uh, prices are going up. Uh, they looked at some pricing data and found significant increases in generally the cost of both sales and rentals. Uh, during the pandemic period. Uh, another conclusion is what they call place-based opportunity is here and available to be shared. By that, they mean that access to clean air, public transportation, high scoring schools, nearby jobs, networks of people who are not in poverty and higher employment engagement by hiring local residents are some of the measurable critical entities that make the specific place people live important to their chances in life. Uh, but then they go on to say that segregation is a part of our present. Segregation exists both historically and in the present day in the Pioneer Valley. Housing costs, deficits, and regulations are reinforcing and continuing to perpetuate segregation across our communities. And finally, I have not say finally, but one of the conclusions related to that is the approach of working regionally on cost availability of housing uh, is one of the primary solutions suggested to begin to change these trends. So I do have a comment on that, which is maybe less of a comment and more of a rant, uh, <laughs> which I expressed to both Keith Ferry and to Mark Melnick Keith is the executive director or CEO of Wayfinders, and Mark is the lead author on the study at the Donahue Institute. Uh, I wrote to both of them, I find it frustrating to see this defined as a quote unquote regional problem. Yes, the geographic area defined in Pioneer Valley does share these problems, but the legal and political authority to address them lies with individual towns as well as state and federal government. While the latter are needed to provide resources, the towns must decide uh, through planning, zoning, and some financing, what can actually happen on the ground. Groups like the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the Franklin Regional uh, Council of Governments and others can consult, convene, and complain, but in fact, they can do nothing if the towns are uninterested in working with them. This is illustrated for me, particularly by the fact that Hampshire County government was literally dissolved two years ago. 
this is a major barrier to scaling up uh, change, which was an idea presented by Frank Robinson, one of the panelists. So to my mind, describing this as a regional problem is very, very limited value. When Wayfinders does a new development, it does not happen in the region. It happens in an individual town or it does not happen. The idea of regional goals for housing production only makes sense in an academic presentation. It does not make sense on the ground. If it did, then Amherst, Beltertown, Hadley, et cetera, would already have a regional housing production plan. Sadly, they do not and are not likely to in the foreseeable future. So that's my rant. I don't know if anybody has a comment on that. Paul, you're familiar more than I am to some extent with the limitations or advantages of local government. I don't know if you have any anything to say or anybody else. No, I, th I mean, um, I have the same frustration you have, John, and I think that, um, you know, Town of Amherst does a lot on affordable housing compared to other communities, as you noted, and I think it's, uh, you know, a model for many others, but it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of patience over time, which we're experiencing with, you know, the most recent project that we're, we're going to hear about tonight that was years in the making, um, yeah. and um, a lot of resources that go into it, but it will happen. And I find that, you know, the affordable housing in Amherst, it really defines a, a major part of what the community is and how it envisions itself. So, um, yeah. It's, it's okay, thanks. Uh, Carol? I think it's so much bigger than that. The town can only do so much and only has so much money. The whole stupid country is so unbalanced <laughs> with how much money is where and how much rent costs that you, whatever you do in that, in that realm there, it, my rant is why are you calling this a solvable problem in this region or someplace else without doing bigger changes at bigger places than anybody's talking about? That's my rant. Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments, folks? Yeah, I think Carol, the panelists, you know, there was um, a number of panelists at the at the meeting and they, <clears throat> some of them mentioned that, that, it, you know, it's beyond housing. It's also about, you know, um, employment opportunities and schooling. And so it's, you know, in, you know, transportation. So once you start looking into it, it really is a combination of factors that need to be addressed. So, you know, there's discussion about, you know, east-west rail and, you know, how do you build up the corridor along 91 with other things. So, I think they realize it. It's it's interesting that um, um, you know. I feel like a lot of people know it, and then some don't, or they don't believe it. I to me, the report just reinforced the need for yeah, thinking collaboratively. I, I agree, John, but I think it's important to say it is regional because I you know I think that hopefully it gets other towns thinking that they can play a part if they change zoning or local regulations. Right, it's a collaborative effort. Um, what surprised me was though the income ranges. So they. You know, they had income ranges for households like you know up to 10 like zero to ten thousand ten to twenty and twenty to thirty five or something and that was a lot of the households right in this in this region and so that's not a lot of household income right if you take the minimum wage and a 40 hour a week job you know so it is telling me is that i feel like the employment and economic piece has to be really bolstered as well as the housing piece so you know they're saying a number of households make you know less than ten thousand a year and so um, you know, if they're saying we need 17,000 apartments with a rent of 500 or less, that's not a lot of income. So I feel like oh. both things need to improve. Um, yeah. I, I found that to be a really big takeaway. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so Allegra has joined us. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Risha and then Ashley to introduce themselves and also Jennifer Taub. So you have to promote Jennifer to a panelist as well, Nate, thanks. But we'll begin with Risha, who is, along with Ashley, our newest members of the Housing Trust. John, should the existing members and myself introduce ourselves and then, you know, maybe. I thought, I thought we'd let Ashley and Risha and Jennifer introduce themselves and then we'd go around quickly. Sure. That's okay. Sure. So, hi, thank you, I'm Risha. Um, Risha Hess, I, I 
have introduced myself to a few of you in the past, but it's really nice to be on the trust at this point. Um, I think I was uh, sworn in two weeks ago, maybe. Um, and uh, I grew up in Amherst. Uh, I went to Fort River um, and graduated from Amherst High School and then left, never to return. Um, and uh, 25 years later, I uh, just returned and, and in the middle of a pandemic. And so it's been a very strange time to come back. Um, but I'm excited to, to be part of this. I, um, career-wise, I am a public health marketer or health communication specialist. Um, and I continue to work in international public health. So I don't do a lot of work in the US. Um, but, and I was overseas for the last 25 years. Um, I lived in India, Kenya, Papua New Guinea, and Ethiopia, uh, if there's any connections out there that are worth exploring. Okay, and uh, that's it, yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really, I grew up in probably what would be now considered uh, income-wise affordable housing, um, but a single family home and coming back and looking at rents and the costs of, of house buying, which is what I eventually did, um, was really shocking. Um, a lot has changed and not for the better in my opinion, so. Okay, thanks, Risha. Ashley? You, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, okay. Right. Um, I'm Ashley Jensen and I live in Amherst for the last couple years and I moved from Northampton and I had lived there only for about four years. And um, before that, I lived in Los Angeles and the housing situation in Los Angeles is abysmal. It's just the worst. I don't know if there's a worse place in the United States. It's, it would be hard to imagine. But I moved to Massachusetts and the housing situation is a lot better here. And then I, I also, I live in a tax credit unit, which I feel really lucky to have even figured out what that is. It's, um, and so I have a lot of experience with like the, um, the rigmarole and it's a very long and arduous process where there's, it's, it's hard to get affordable housing, even when you find one. And so um, I'm really hoping to contribute to the, the trust, but also um, my, with my experience. And I'm hoping to go to UMass and figure out my career life in the future. <laughs> I'm not totally sure yet. Great, thanks, Ashley. And Jennifer is the liaison from the town council. So that means she's not an appointed member unless you consider a town council appointment to be the equivalent. So I welcome Jennifer and I appreciate your agreeing to be here tonight. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I was really, um, I was really eager to be the liaison that this was really the affordable housing trust is was my top choice. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I should say I'm really have been instructed that I should kind of be a fly on the wall. <laughs> I'm, you know, I report back what you discussed to the council, but I'm really not supposed to in any way interfere or really, you know, be an active participant in the in the meetings. But I'm but I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here and just I guess just a brief recap of my background that um, I did start my career as a community organizer, um, developing something called neighborhood housing services programs, um, which were programs across the, the country that were, um, and this is going back a ways, this was in the 80s, um, that were really designed to combat uh, financial institution and insurance industry redlining. And it was to help, um, homeowners in older urban communities, neighborhoods that were starting to show signs of decline to be able to get home improvement loans to keep their neighborhoods from kind of that, that tipping point. Uh, the organization is now uh, called NeighborWorks, which still exists, you might be familiar with, they have an office in Springfield. But so I've always been very passionate about housing and neighborhoods and affordable housing and Part of what I've really been struck by in Amherst, and I have to say, John, you've been on top of this probably longer than anyone, is that Amherst 
um, non-student population, non-student households are actually declining. And our most recent census revealed that. And we're really losing a lot of families. We can see it in the declining enrollment in school. I mean, that's not the only reason, but part of it. And I'm very concerned, and this is just personally, this is not speaking for anyone else on the council. Uh, John and I have discussed this, but um, that as more you know, outside investors seem to really be honing in on neighborhoods throughout Amherst because of our, frankly, student population where there's a major return on investment. And I would like, you know, to see more houses maintained for, you know, our non, for year round for families and retirees and, you know, young workers and, and rental houses to be able to remain at an affordable cost. And I, think that the more it's so tempting for investors to purchase houses and rent them by the bedrooms at prices that are out of reach for anyone, but you know, unrelated tenants each paying for a bedroom. So um, that's part of what you know, drove me to want to seek a seat on the council. But, um, and you know, the, the, I'm also a member of the community resources committee and we're going to be um, you know, dedicated to implementing the, uh, comprehensive housing policies and strategies for how we can deliver on the goals in that document. Great, thanks, Jennifer. And I just mentioned that uh, Jennifer and I met together maybe a couple of months ago um, when she became the liaison and a member of town council. And I said, I really look forward to hearing what she has to say. And as I have said to the council president, Lynn Griesemer, in the past, uh, I always felt like we always got very valuable contributions from the members of the select board who were liaisons, Connie Kruger, Alyssa Brewer, Doug Slaughter, and that uh, I didn't want to see Jennifer or any other liaison feel like they couldn't speak their mind uh, in this meeting. And I assured her that probably just about everybody else would feel the same way. And I see people shaking their hands or putting thumbs up or whatever. So welcome. So let's Thank do you. quick introductions. Uh, I am John Hornick and I've been uh, chair of this group for two or three years. Uh, and I am a retired, I guess, evaluation and planning person in human services, particularly mental health and uh, housing. So Carol, would you go next? Oh uh, yeah, hi, I'm Carol Lewis. I'm uh, somebody who's done different things all the time. I was a carpenter for a while. I worked with community land trusts for a while. I now still do a little bit of fiscal consulting with various nonprofits. Um, and housing, the, the, one of the main nonprofits, the, working with the community land trust movement and that organ, the organization I worked with um, got me very interested in, afford in affordable housing and in just different ways of thinking about land use and housing altogether. And I've been here for, I don't remember, numbers that keep changing, like how long you've been somewhere, <laughs> the number keeps changing, so I don't remember it. Anyway, I've been here for a while and I'm very grateful for all the new people and thank you very much. Thanks, Carol. And Paul, probably everybody knows you, but let me give you a chance if you want to add anything. No, I just Paul Bachman, town manager. Um, I do want to, I'm really happy with our two new members. I mean, and they both bring unique care um, experience, Ashley with her experience na trying to navigate the affordable housing system. And that was very compelling to have her participate. And Risha has, and she hasn't mentioned, but additional uh, personal experience uh, with people with the unhoused community and stuff. So I think they bring very powerful experiences to the committee that will really inform the decision making. So I'm really thrilled that they were able to join. I agree, thank you. Erica? Sorry, it always takes me a while to unmute myself. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Erica Piedad um, and I actually work for the Department of Public Health and um, I've worked both in substance use disorder and now I work with the Office of Local and Regional Health uh, housing should be a right. Uh, we know that unhoused individuals are at very high risk for lots of different morbidity and mortality. Um, and I'm very interested in from unhoused all the way to someone being able to 
have their in, uh, have their own home and own their own home. And we know people who own their own home also then are able to accumulate capital that they can often give to their children and, and are able to move forward. And I know for a lot of people of color that has not been the opportunity. So I'm very, very excited to be working with our two new members and very excited to continue working on this very impactful um, board. Thanks, Erica. Allegra? Hi, I'm Allegra. I am also a returning Amherst High School grad. Um, I've been back <laughs> in Amherst for about almost four years now. Um, and some of my, oh my gosh, I can't with this flat hat. Um, my work experience, I've worked with um, people at risk of losing their housing and doing rental assistance in the past. And I'm currently working with primarily people with substance use and mental health disorders. Great, thanks. Rob? I'm Rob Crowder. Um, I, I work for a nonprofit that among other things, uh, provides advice and financing to community land trusts. And in addition to my um, position on, on this, Board. I also am on the board of the Amherst Community Land Trust. Thanks. And Sid? Um, good evening, everyone. First, I apologize for being late. Uh, I was in a graduation celebration here at UMass. So, you know, we went a little over. Um, Sid Ferreira, I work at UMass, special assistant to the vice chancellor for student affairs and campus life. Um, I joined the board, I'm also part of the Human Rights Commission and I joined the board of, one is because I believe that housing is a human right, period. Um, second was, and John knows this, I had somebody who was working with me about five years ago, which made a decent salary and I asked her why she didn't live in town and she said, well, because I can't afford it. Um, and I was like, whoa, you know, then I need to get involved and figure out how I can be, you know, a, uh, you know, an advocate for, for folks like um, this uh, woman that, that worked with me. So I've been in the trust, I think it's five years and uh, it's been uh, an amazing experience. And um, I'm, I think that for the two new folks coming in, you will enjoy it, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, it's an amazing experience and, and uh, and there's results, and that's that's the thing that um, I like about this this uh, this trust is that it's results oriented, and you see outcomes. Um, so, welcome, and uh, hope you have as productive time as I've had, had in this in this commission, in this trust. Thanks. Thanks, Sid. And Sid's the person I go to if I have questions about UMass policy and actions. Although I don't hold them accountable for those. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Nate Malloy is the principal staff to the Housing Trust. So Nate, could you briefly introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, John. Hi, everyone. I'm a planner with the town. I've been working with the town for uh, 12 years and um, I've always staffed the housing committee. So before the trust, it was housing and sheltering and then it was a ho uh, fair housing, housing partnership. So um, I also do a lot with just planning in general for housing and, and projects. So. Uh, something I'm interested in, and I'm I'm glad I can help. And uh, yeah. And okay, and I, I also I try not to interject sorry. too much, but um, you know, it's really the trust, and I'm here to help facilitate. It's always helpful. You're always a good source of information and ideas, Nate, and I appreciate it. And I also want to ask Rita Farrell to introduce herself. She is a part-time consultant to the trust. Um, but in some ways, even though she's part-time, a very significant contributor to the work that we do. Um, thanks, thanks, John. So yes, a very part-time consultant to the trust. I spent um, uh, a big part of my professional career doing affordable housing work. I, for 30 years, I um, was part of the community assistance team at the Massachusetts Housing Partnership which is a Boston-based uh, statewide quasi-public organization. And um, while I started out doing some lending work there, I ultimately oversaw um, community assistance. Um, MHP worked with um, communities throughout the Commonwealth. So I've 
kind of bring that perspective, having um, worked with housing trusts, housing authorities, nonprofits um, across the, the Commonwealth. I've been retired for about five years. I maintain, in fact, just went to an event and acted on a project that I worked on for a number of years. So that was really fun because affordable housing can take a long time. And it was kind of great to see things coming to fruition that I had been involved with. Um, and so I, I do, and I worked on projects in Amherst. I live in Shutesbury, so it was always wonderful to be close to, close to home and not in Provincetown for a night meeting or in Williamstown for a night meeting. Um, and uh, so I don't do any other consulting. I just do it for the trust because it's sort of where my heart is. And um, I also serve just in case you see my name around, I'm the chair of the um, select board in the town of Shutesbury and also on the Community Preservation Committee. So we have quite a group of people <laughs> to work with here. And it's been wonderful working with everybody. And I'm glad, as Paul said, that uh, Ashley and Risha have joined us. OK, um, one other, what I hope will be a short piece of business. I distributed the March minutes. I'm still working on January and February. Um, but if people have comments on the March minutes, um, I would uh, like to hear them. I didn't have any substantive uh, comments. I think there was one minor typo, uh, and I'm trying to find it. It was it was anything was supposed to be as, so there was just an extra W. Um, okay, just uh, point it out to me because I'll never find yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll put it, I'll send you an, an email. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Concerns or comments? Okay, then uh, we will now move on to the main event for this evening. Um, we invited Wayfinders to do a presentation on uh, their proposal to do uh, housing development at the East Street School site and the newer Belchertown Road site. And uh, as people probably know at this point, they have been selected as the group that the town will contract with to do that development. That's still in an early stage as far as I know, um, although we'll learn more. Um, the person primarily presenting tonight is Diane Smith, who is the uh, chief real estate officer for Wayfinders. I think she's only been with Wayfinders for a year or two. And before that, she worked in Connecticut state government in a variety of positions relating to housing and finance. So I do welcome Diane. Um, she will be kind of backed up by Michelle McAdara and Rachel Belanger, who have also both been involved in the planning for this proposal. So, uh, Diane, or can we have to pr promote Diane to be a panelist, right, Nate? So I was muted. Um, yeah, I've just promoted Michelle, uh, Rachel, and Diane to panelists. And so that also gives you the ability to share your screen. And I'm sure they have plenty to share, actually, things that we all want to see. So I, I welcome wanna... the three of you and thank you for all the work that you've done thus far and for all the work that you will do on behalf of affordable housing in the town of Amherst. Thanks, I just wanna let everyone know that this meeting is recorded and so it you know, becomes a, a video on the town website. So people do watch it afterwards sometimes. If they're really, really interested in affordable housing, they have to cozy up to that trust meeting. Um, well, um, thank you. I, I would say that when we joined as a panelist, my whole screen went black and I got terrified for a second there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am going to try to share my screen. I've got Rachel as my technical backup here because I, I'm not always sure what I'm doing. Um, let's see. I don't know what you all are seeing. Looks like we're seeing the title slide. Perfect. Then I got something right. That's great. Um, so first, um, thank you so much for having us uh, here this evening. We're very, very excited 
um, to talk with you about our proposal uh, for the East Street School and the Beltertown Road. I want to really thank the trust um, for your leadership and your vision and making these two sites available for affordable housing development. And we're very, very excited to work with you and the others in the town to uh, bring this project into fruition. We also really want to thank you for the careful consideration that went into the RFP. Um, it provided you know, due diligence in advance, um, aligning the, the RFP requirements with funding, permitting processes that affordable housing developers work within. So you really were very thoughtful about how you put that together and including requirements related to fair housing, uh, sustainable design, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And all of those things are at the core of Wayfinder's mission and values. So thank you so much. So I wanna uh, give you um, a, a brief overview um, on who Wayfinders is. A, a number of you were familiar with HAP Housing and that became Wayfinders and some of the work that uh, we've been undertaking for several years. Um, we, we are a nonprofit that's headquartered in Springfield. Um, we tackle affordable housing crisis from a few angles. Someone had mentioned uh, being able to see someone from being unhoused potentially uh, buying their own home. And really Wayfinders plays a role in all of those spaces um, in working with folks who are, who are currently homeless or been chronically homeless, um, who are surviving domestic violence. Um, and as they are moving through their own housing experience and providing them supports all along the way. Um, and we are also a developer and a property manager. Uh, we have a couple of properties in Amherst I, I know that you're familiar with and we've been very, very, um, We've had very, very good relations with the town with regard to those, those properties and are very pleased that they've gone so well. Because we develop properties um, with a commitment to owning and managing, uh, we're invested in working with the community. So that is why, you know, even with the, the properties we currently have, uh, Olympia and Butternut, we spend an awful lot of time and energy making sure we're in contact with municipal officials on services and, and making sure that our, our properties are well maintained and that you understand what's going on. Um, we manage over 800 units and the majority of our portfolio is in the Pioneer Valley, um, in Amherst, in Northampton, in Holyoke, um, in Springfield. And we also extend a bit east and west to communities in Great Barrington, Ludlow and Ware. In terms of serving those who don't live in our properties, our housing centers in Springfield, Holyoke and Northampton, are places where anyone can come and gain access to a wide variety of pro programs, including emergency rental assistance, first time home buyer education, or employment support services. So let me step into a little bit about our partners with regard to the project on the two sites. Um, for this project, we focused on the best practices in energy efficiency and assembled a team that had the expertise to meet the goals of the town's RFP, including those related to sustainable design. The Narrowgate is one of the most experienced designers of affordable housing in the state, and their experience is suited to both the adapted reuse of the school and new construction. The Center for Eco-Technology is also a core member and is working with Wayfinders on other projects. They're a fantastic resource to review plans and to advise us. And as we plan for the next phase of the of design, we'll be selecting a construction manager to advise the team on costs and constructability at every step of the way. One of the things we wanted to review with you today is um, the, re the requirements of the RFP and what our proposal um, had, had presented to, uh, to the municipality and to the trust with regard to what we wanted to have happen in those two sites. The RFP was closely aligned with our experience and providing a family housing and a vision to create a range of housing options in the region. Our proposal met and exceeded the town's requirements and goals for the sites. And really where I'd like to sort of point out for you is that the, the RFP required at least 40 units um, for households uh, below 60% or below of AMI. And our proposal proposes 45 units um, at 60% or below of AMI and 70 units in total over the two sites. Um, the RFP required at least 13% of affordable units that are, that are affordable to folks at or below 30% AMI. And we, our proposals suggest 25% of our units being affordable to the very low income, extremely low income population. Um, 
there was a, a, a desire to have a number of units that were available to larger families with two or three bedrooms so that the, the RFP uh, wanted 66% of, of the units being uh, made available to larger, larger families. And ours of the 70 units that we're proposing, 74% are two and three bedrooms. Um, we are focused on green, sustainable climate and resilient design. We are pursuing passive house and enterprise green communities uh, certifications and solar as well. So that is part of our proposal. In addition, in terms of management, uh, we, we do manage our own properties. They're frequently, uh, and actually in all of our properties, we have property management offices on site. And for our proposal, we would suggest having a property management office on each site on, uh, of the two sites. So that is some of the, the, those are the ways that we approach the, the responding to the RFP. Uh, we put together a very strong team. We really felt we put together a very strong proposal. We're very happy that you agree. I want to stop for a moment um, and ask if you have any questions about what I presented so far. I'll just make a quick comment, Diane. Mm -hmm. um, when we wrote the RFP, we did have what we considered to be base requirements. And we did hope that the selected developer would exceed those. And obviously, you've done that. And personally, I couldn't be more pleased about that. And I'm sure the other members of the trust feel that way as well, because we worked pretty hard on both what the minimum requirements were and our desire to see uh, the actual project exceed those. Thank you. So the East Street vision, I have to say, um, when we did the walk around on the property, I, I was so excited about this site. Um, really love the neighborhood. I am, I, as John mentioned, I'm from Connecticut. I still live in Connecticut. Um, but this was really just, just a very exciting thing uh, to try to, to, to move forward and to think about. So I'm gonna briefly walk you through uh, this concept for each of the sites. Um, and what I want to, to let you know is that the design for both the sites is driven by the desire to have our more, more barrier-free housing, um, and that's a huge gap that, it, that in the existing rental market, and to blend the opportunity for a significant quantity of new housing with a neighborhood context and scale. Some of the other drivers at this early stage was uh, to provide wetland buffers, and our goal was to create shared outdoor spaces. So our proposal for East Street, uh, each, the East Street site converts the, the existing school to six apartments and then weaves it into a three-story addition um, with the front portion of the site you can see here. Uh, and we envision a fairly traditional style for the new construction because it, it, it seems to, it mirrors the existing uh, neighborhood. So we really wanted it to fit right in. What you see here is um, the main entrance. I'm not really sure if you can see my cursor, but this little bubble on the bottom. The main entrance would be through a shared courtyard. And uh, that's where the, the school and the new construction areas would connect. Um, the property management office and the common space on the ground floor would create a hub of activity. And it's located near the, the community room and next to the courtyard. And that would really enable larger events to spill outside in good weather. So there has this, this very, a flexible indoor outdoor um, type of experience for the neighbors. Um, the, ex the elevator is uh, located between the school and the new construction portion, and that would uh, act as a bridge between the different floor elevations and make all the units visible. So re regardless of where you are in the property, you have access all the way through via the, the elevators. Um, both properties have a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms. And for this site, the new construction port portion has two and three bedrooms on the first two floors with one bedrooms um, on, the, on the above. So the unit mix in this particular uh, development that would have nine one bedrooms, 15 two bedrooms and five three bedrooms with a total of 29 just for this particular site. So I, was, I will stop here um, and see if you had any questions about this particular site and the design. Okay. Belchertown Road Vision. Um, so for Belchertown, we, we looked at a, a bunch of different options for townhouses or multiple buildings. 
And we found that a single larger building would be the best way to accomplish Wayfinders and the town's goals for accessibility, energy performance, and creating an outdoor gathering space. So from the Belt of Town Road, you would see a two-story portion um, in the front that transitions to three stories in the rear. And what we, what the uh, architect's rendering um, that you see here, we used subtle changes in color of siding and roof lines to create a feeling of multiple smaller buildings. So you, you see here that even though this is all one building, it looks like three. So there sort of, it breaks it up um, as you're looking at it. And the ground floor would have a similar combination of common spaces as the East Street site, where the hub um, would be here in this general area, um, where the property management resident services staff are the eyes and ears of the community and have a visible presence. And in the rear, the building frames an outdoor space that connects directly to the community room. And you know, I, I remember us having this conversation around the community room and really thinking that, that having it back here and overlook the backside, the, the backyard, the patio area, you know, where kids could be playing and, and people can, can have an opportunity to see their kids. And um, that was a really sort of a nice way to, to lay out the property um, and have that common space. For this, uh, this building, there would be nine one bedrooms, 22 two bedrooms and 10 three bedrooms with a total of 41 units in this building. Are there any questions about this? Okay, you guys are very quiet. Yeah, I, I point out that uh, the parking area, which is right mm -hmm. along Belchertown Road, serves as a kind of buffer between the main residential part of the property and the uh, and Belcher Town Road. Yes, um, you know, in visiting the site a few times, um, you you are more certainly more familiar than I am. This is a very busy road, um, and we were thinking that uh, in order to provide some quiet enjoyment for the residents here, to give them a little space between the the, the noise of the road um, and their and their apartments would be um, a good feature um, to to again to give them some some quiet enjoyment there. I just want to say I'm quiet because I'm in absolute awe um, in terms of developing the RFP. This is this is just amazing. So it, I, I'm speechless. It's it looks wonderful. And Paul, very happy. Made up. <laughs> Thank you. I just <clears throat> I'm wondering maybe <clears throat> is there? It looks like there's bike storage inside. Do people have any storage options other than just what's inside their own unit in this, in either of these two places? Oh, Rachel, can you help me out there? Yeah, so we, we do have um, resident storage at some sites, like but at Butternut Farms, there's um, kind of a storage locker system. Uh, we didn't show it in the plans for either site in this proposal because with the number of units, it just, um, becomes kind of a fairness issue. If, if you can't provide it to everyone, then how do you um, allocate that space? And it would be probably too much building area to provide everyone. Um, but we felt that the bike storage was important and having that on the ground floor so that you don't end up trekking you know, your, your bike into the elevator and then digging up the hallway on the way to your apartment. So I was just wondering, so if you, you provide storage, you probably lose units, more or less. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always a trade-off. Um, and I think looking at, yeah, what's, what's the best use of, of any given space? And um, just with the goal of cost effectiveness, you know, looking at getting the most bang for our buck in terms of office space and, and resident amenities. Uh, but it's certainly something that the team could look into and, and get a sense of what that would entail. Okay, and I just, I was, just one more thing. So everything is, there's no studios. Everything is a, has a bedroom and a living room. Okay, I was just, not, not these particular two things, and maybe this will come up later in other projects, but I wonder if, um, because that report that I listened to, we need 17,000 units of $500 and less um, 
apartments to like fill the need of the region. And I just wonder if some projects need to have a lot of studios to get 17,000 units of $500 or less um, cost. That's just something I was thinking about. Thanks, yeah, I'll, um, while we're on that, I'll say a little bit about the unit sizes. So we work within ranges that are established by the Department of Housing and Community Development. So a one bedroom will be between 600 and 660 square feet, a two bedroom will be between 800 and 880, um, and the three bedrooms start at 950 um, and usually end up close to that. Um, so we have we have guidelines even for you know, room sizes within each apartment. Um, and the, the household size needs to be paired to an appropriate number of bedrooms. So there may be a household that needs a $500 apartment and you could provide a studio for 500, um, but we can't allow four people to live in a studio um, by, by health code. Right, okay. And I'll add that our goals for this project were that it would be there primarily to serve families. And so that's something that was a limitation of what Wayfinders could do, which they respected. This really does look, at least to me, like a family project. But yeah, I, um, first off, I'd wanna say like the proposal that Wayfinders put together, we had two very, very high quality proposals that were submitted. Wayfinders was a really superb presentation of your information. So thank you for the work that you put into that because it really made the job harder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had two really high quality proposals and the, the town is fortunate to have that. I was really appreciative of what you did with um, the uh, school on um, uh, on East Street. It was uh, We were told early on that that building could not be preserved. You've done a very creative way to in include that into your design. So really appreciate, appreciated that. Um, and you know, th these two parcels are within proximity of our village center. So one of the questions that I think we de deserve additional conversation, not tonight, but just to, ident to identify it is, is, is the location of this building. And I get uh, what Diane said about moving it so that the residents have some quietude from the street, but in a village center, we, we instead of being sort of a sur suburban looking center, we're trying, we, are tending to look at bringing buildings up to the street to create more of a uh, semi-urban feel um, with some a slight setback from the street. And I think that's a conversation for us to have because we're looking at it, doing some sidewalk improvements in this area and really creating East Amherst as, East Amherst as a village center. Um, so that's, I mean, the planning department is thinking really hard about that. Um, so I just think that I just want to flag that as something that in terms of location, this is not set in stone in terms of location of the, of the building. Um, and we might want to have that conversation about what, where exactly in the lot it's located. Thank you. Any other questions? We talked, um, and I heard as you all were introducing yourselves about um, having a need to serve very low income households and extremely low income households. Uh, so I want to kind of give you a sense of what those incomes look like uh, at this point. Uh, HUD actually updates its income ranges um, once a year in, a, in April. So we expect to, to be updating this information. But when we're looking at folks at 30% of the AMI, um, we're looking at households between $17,000 and $26,000. Um, from one to four, four people um, in the household. And, you know, right now, the 60% 60, 60 of the area median income for a family of four in this region is about $50,000. And that really means that there, you've got a single earner that's making $24, $24 an hour or, you know, two earners at, at $12 an hour. Um, so we're really focused on making sure that we're providing um, really good quality housing that is that is part of a community that is affordable to, to families who really just aren't making a lot of money. Um, I'd sort of broken this down to you earlier when we were looking at the two properties, uh, but our proposal uh, does have at this point 70 units as, as part of their proposal with 29 units in East Street and set 41 units at Belter Town Road. Um, one of the things I'd also want to mention to you is that we are making this proposal assuming that um, 
tax credits. This will be a low income housing tax credit development. And knowing that Amherst uh, actually is a, a town that does have an awful lot of students, um, the requirements of low income housing tax credit does not allow for student housing. So that is not, they would not be eligible for this, these properties. These are really for families um, as permanent housing. Um, with regard to the timeline, um, you know, our, our focus um, for the next, for the first several months, uh, is a stakeholder engagement. And then following the execution of the land development agreement, agreement um, our focus will be on the due diligence needed to, um, to get to move forward to the project eligibility application with DHCD. And one of the big drivers in looking at the pre-development timeline is when we can be ready to submit a pre-application to DHCD. So DHCD um, does its application process in two phases. Uh, you submit a pre-application and then you can be invited into a full application if you meet certain criteria. Um, so they do have a, their, their funding is it, uh, based on an annual cycle. Their pre-applications are generally at the end of October and they require zoning approval as well as local funding commitments. And with that in mind, we're planning for a fall 2023 pre-application and a January 2024 full application to DHCD. So it'll give us a little time to get, to get going with our planning. Um, and then once the, the application, uh, the full application that's, that's generally due in January um, is made to DHCD, they may, they may pass on that and then invite you to a smaller application um, uh, funding round if there's also uh, local commitments that are made. So they have the, the full round and they have something called a mini round. So there are times in where a property may, may or a, a development proposal will get another shot um, at, a, at a funding round. So um, I think I, I will stop here um, in, uh, in terms of our, our overall presentation. Um, if there are additional questions or comments from the trust or any other member of the community, I'm not really sure um, how many folks have actually showed up here. Um, and then as time allows, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, recommendations for outreach. Um, we can also talk about if you haven't been involved in construction or housing development most recently, um, there, there's significant changes in construction costs that then that people are experiencing nationally. And we can talk about that a little bit as well, if you'd like to. Um, but I think I'll just, I'll, I'll just stop here and, and see if uh, you have any other questions or comments. That's great, Diane. I really appreciate this. Um, so other people with questions or comments? I mean, when I saw the proposal, my re reaction was a little bit like Erica reported earlier, which I was kind of stunned at how interesting this looks, as well as how responsive it is to the criteria that we put in the RFP. Um, if we can get this built, this will be terrific. I will stop sharing so that uh, we can all see one another. Um. Does, does any, any of the attendees have a question they want to raise? If you do, raise your hand, please. I actually have a question as well. I just, I might have missed this, but is the income mix, like 30, 60 market, is that evenly distributed amongst bedroom sizes as well? <laughs> just, we're all, yes. We're all nodding. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's just to be clear, there's there's not of the 70 units and the four different income levels. It's not um, a quarter of the units to each of those income levels, but the unit sizes and the accessible units um, would be evenly distributed by income level. Um, and really, I'll, I'll just add to that to say. Every, any possible variable that you can distribute needs to be distributed. So if we look at um, low-income units needing to be on all three levels of the building, front, back, side to side, um, not just distributed by the, the bedroom type. So it's, it's quite a puzzle when you go to actually assign the units. Well, yeah, it I looks will amazing. Say, 
Yeah, I'll just add that one of the things that I think was important to the trust members is that this not be entirely a low income development. And, uh, you know, we have everything from 30% area median income up to a small number of market rate units, 200% or sorry, 100% area median income, 60 and then 30. And so I think that Wayfinders did an excellent job of reaching that goal. Does that look okay to you, Allegra? Do I do I remember that the ones that are above 80% have to be at East Street because they can't be on Belchertown Road for some reason? Is that true? So yeah, okay. You're you're right that there's a difference between the two sites. Um, but the income limit there would be a hundred percent. Um, and I, my understanding is that's because the Belchertown Road property was purchased using Community Preservation Act funds yeah. and CPA um, can only serve households under 100% AMI. Other comments? Okay, the next thing on our agenda, we can come back to this project because the next thing is related. Um, Nate and I have discussed having a larger community of forum, not in the next week or two, but probably uh, in the summer or the fall, in which obviously wayfinders would be invited back. They'd be a little bit further along. Probably we'd have a land development agreement with them and maybe some other progress that we would have to report by that time. So uh, I guess I'm, the floor is open for uh, suggestions related to uh, a community forum. I should say, I've also talked a little bit to the Unitarian Universalist Society about having this a face-to-face -face forum there, or maybe it could be hybrid, but. Um, that is a possibility for us. It isn't necessarily entirely a, a Zoom community meeting. So thoughts people have about who should be included. Obviously, we want to include neighbors, particularly those who are legally identified as abutters. At, at the risk of being obvious, I mean, Fort River community would be a key stakeholder in the construction that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I was going to say that we're still working on a land development agreement, which serves as a contract with wayfinders between the town and wayfinders. And then their schedule is, you know, aligned with what we were thinking. Um, it also, you know, has to align with the funding cycle and everything. So I don't want to get ahead of wayfinders. So, you know, John said the summer or fall, and we would work with them, you know, in the town just to make sure that we're not, you know, we're not hosting an event before they're ready. So if you, you know, if your schedule works and, you know, whether it's July or September, we would defer to Wayfinders just to make sure that they're ready. Um, you know, it does become a pretty big public event, right? So this is a comprehensive <laughs> permit. It's, um, you know, they're gonna be seeking a lot of waivers from the zoning requirements. It's something we support. And, you know, 132 Northampton Road was a comprehensive permit, but it's not a, you know, a by right use. So there will be a lot of discussions with the neighbors um, what this means, what this looks like. So although these there are concept designs now, it may change through permitting. Um, you know, there could be some slight changes to the site design. Um, you know, we're saying they say 70 units now, it could be that, you know, maybe it's 68, maybe it's 72, right? So in their proposal it was 65 to 75. So there's a target um, for a number of units. And some of that has to go through permitting. Uh, I do think a public meeting is a good thing to start it off. And then there's a public comment period with the initial um, product eligibility piece. And so I'd like to have that forum kind of kick off that if the timing's right. So we can, you know, have, you know, we're not doing double duty and having redundant meetings, but we could have one serve a few functions and then move it forward. So I, I you know, I think that's a, I think it's a good idea, um, location to be determined and format, but if that works for Wayfinders, I think something, you know, this summer or fall is, is you know, is a good idea. I think we also should consider whether a smaller piece of the meeting should be used to introduce additional goals that the trust have beyond this project. Because as I always say, 
Um, it's great to have this project moving into the pipeline, but I'm always looking to see what other opportunities there are for us to get the next project and the one after that into the pipeline. Carol? Um, I was just wondering if we could think about some of the techniques of outreach that we want to use in order to get people into the buildings to also get people into the meetings about the buildings. So up front, begin to consider some of the places that we maybe don't usually advertise such things that uh, so that the public meeting would maybe have a bigger cross section of the public. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be open to any suggestions. Um, I know from my recent experience, um, it's a lot of work, particularly to uh, reach out to communities of color and low income individuals in Amherst. We do pretty well with the middle class white population, but not as well with the other folks. And so we need to figure out how to improve on what we do. What, what have you used before? I mean, where, where do you usually advertise? Like newspapers, Facebook? Newspapers, what? there are about two dozen organizations in Amherst um, of all different stripes that I ask to publicize any of our events. Uh, and generally they do that through their Facebook pages or their uh, other communications with their membership. And that ranges from the Business Improvement District to the League of Women Voters of Amherst to the local churches, anybody I can think of. Um, but recently, working particularly with Sid and to some extent with Erica, we've tried to figure out how to do a better job of reaching out to persons of color to complete an adult survey for our age and dementia friendly project, which we're working on that I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, we're trying to do our best to get more surveys in from those groups than we ordinarily would. So any ideas you have, Ashley, will absolutely be welcome as will ideas from anybody else. Have we thought about doing outreach to like the teachers unions or other professional unions that have people who are working in town but might not be able to either afford live, to live here or are struggling with maintaining their housing here? Not the teachers union per se, Allegra, but I have reached out to the superintendent and of schools and uh, uh, Mike has, uh, published announcements of meetings that we do on uh, school system communications with teachers and parents. Um, again, something we could do more of, but we've done a little bit of it and maybe we could improve on it. And, and some of the information that you also provide, John, goes on the parents newsletter because I get that because of my involvement in ABC. So it does show up in the parents newsletter also. Um, so the survey, the mentioned survey um, showed up over there in, in various Great. places. Yeah. Thanks, Sid. So, yeah, we, we've, we, we do it and it's somewhat effective, but we could improve. Um, so this is very close to where I grew up. Um, I'm very familiar with the neighborhood. Uh, I do... So Fort River seems like a really obvious one, um, not just the teachers union, which I think is a great idea, but that community, I mean, the kids who are already going there, obviously you want kids who might not already go there as well. Um, but thinking through that, it might also be smart to think through the timing of this forum. I, I know there's a lot of variables that will decide when it is, but it might be smart to wait until the school year starts um, so that the families are back in the area if they do travel for the summer. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Risha. Something for us definitely to consider. Other comments or ideas? Diane, do you, either you or uh, 
Michelle or Rachel have thoughts based on your prior experiences? I know you've got lots of them in trying to uh, talk to communities about project plans. Yeah, I think um, Michelle has really been at the helm at uh, the work that we've done in Amherst in the past. Michelle, did you want to talk about how we've how we've done that work in the past? Remember going door to door in a round butternut uh, neighborhood. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm going back quite a few years, but we did do that. But, you know, in other communities, we've gone to the senior centers and posted there, had sessions at the senior centers. We've always had pretty good turnouts at senior centers. We've posted flyers in the local elementary schools. We've asked uh, superintendents if we could put know a flyer give it for the children to bring home and they have allowed that i don't know if amherst superintendent would allow that um local businesses um not only the larger ones but your smaller ones you know your smaller restaurants um sometimes they're willing to post suppliers too or hand them out to employees um there's all different avenues you know i think the most successful though has been really get to like places like the senior centers, uh, boys and girls clubs, and things like that, especially if we talk about families. You know, that's great. We'll definitely be collaborating on this, including the date and approaches to outreach. Um, and uh, this is not the last time that we'll be talking about organizing a forum for this purpose. Yeah, so, so I, I just say, to that, um, you know, we, you know, there's Amherst Human Service Network and uh, the Council of Social Service Agencies in Hampshire County, which we advertise through. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think we do put a lot of public outreach out there. Maybe that then the follow up, right? It's easy to dismiss an email or two, and so then it may be, you know, is there are there other ways just to reinforce the message um, or encourage people to come to a meeting? Because um, I do think it gets out there. Um, what I was going to say that typically when a project starts and if it is um, you know, uh, corresponding with permitting, the town also has a web page where we will have, um, you know, a product information. We may have a, um, a survey form or a comment form that all the comments received get compiled through the town. It's something we, we typically do. Um, and then that gets folded into the product eligibility and the comprehensive permit process. So, you know, in terms of public comment, and as we get closer, you know, we can strategize about ways to you know, have a web presence or if, you know, Wayfinders, if you have something in terms of collecting comments, but usually we'd like to do that, just have a central portal for things to be, um, um, you know, stored in. So even if we receive comments through letters or emails, we end up putting everything in one place and it's, you know, we can compile it easily uh, and it's, you know, viewable for the public. So for Northampton Road, we did that. And for North Square, we did something similar. And so you know, we'd have, uh, I'd like to have a similar process for this project as well, whether it's, you know, uh, an engage Amherst or, you know, how we, we manage it, but have some, some place where information can be readily available. Yeah, I'll just say people. briefly that, go ahead. Go ahead. The page on the Wayfinders website um, is now live. So we don't have the capability for um, commenting set up, but just, to make some of the, the basic project information about you know, what was our proposal and what's the timeline. Um, that's, that's up on our website. Yeah, I was gonna say, I couldn't share the proposal with folks because it's so big <laughs> that my copy of it exists on a thumb drive. <laughs> and so it, it really isn't shareable. Um, maybe after this, we can uh, share the slides that Diane used, which are uh, uh, a definitely a simpler approach to the presentation than all the detail of the actual proposal. Okay, other thoughts? Okay, um, then um, we can move on to other agenda items. Again, I want to thank Diane, Michelle, and Rachel for both their work on developing the proposal and for being here tonight to do this presentation for us. And we look forward to working with two out of the three of you in the future.
Thank you, Thank you very Have much for your time. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Um, our next agenda item has to do with potential changes to the zoning bylaw. Um, as Jennifer mentioned earlier in her introduction, there is a bit of competition between the use of housing in Amherst for students and uh, the use of housing in Amherst for families. And each year, the competition seems to increase. At least that's my experience. Uh, including in my own neighborhood. <laughs> so I asked Jennifer if she would talk a bit about that and both some combination of what she personally thinks the direction for change might be, as well as what the Community Resources Committee is working on to look at possible changes. So Jennifer, are you? Oh, okay. thank you. Well, I was just, <laughs> you know, briefly, um, you know, could review, you know, some of what's on the community resources docket, which is really about, you know, just housing generally. And we're, you know, now at the point where we're gonna, you know, kind of be deciding, you know, how and which, you know, would be, would be able to implement first, but some of the, um, what's, you know, kind of on a matrix that we have and also what the planning department has suggested. I could just, you know, that we're looking at, um, you know, different uh, tiers of housing, you know, to have different tiers of apartments. Um, and we're looking at, um, you know, what, what you know, apart, the definition of apartments, would it be 24 units? Would it be over 24 units? Would we have, you know, sort of different classes of apartments? Because, you know, we definitely, you know, are looking at more, you know, options um, for housing in Amherst. Um, we're looking at um, duplexes, you know, whether um, and how we might go about um, allowing duplexes and triplexes by right in uh, different residential districts. Um, we'll be, you know, uh, looking at, you know, cottage developments and really how we can just um, facilitate more options for housing to serve, you know, the in, entire um, community in Amherst. Um, so personally, what I'm, and this is just speaking for myself, as we said, uh, you know, would just be concerned about is, you know, some of the strategies, I think we all agree, those are goals, <laughs> and inclusionary, you know, expanding inclusionary zoning, those are we all, you know, share, I think the same goals, but it's, you know, how we can ensure that if we allow for more development of duplexes and triplexes, you know, that it will in fact serve everyone in the, in the community. And, you know, some of that it, um, I think sometimes left to market forces alone, of course, you know, there's it, the greatest return on investment is what will prevail. So what strategies can be developed to ensure that, you know, housing serves all residents and frankly, not predominantly the student market. So part of, yeah, what, so um, I think that the, the, the wayfinder is just, um, even the design, the way it looks is, uh, you know, I'm kind of awestruck <laughs> by that. It was um, really very exciting. But, um, you know, I think just a, a general trend around the country is, you know, private development money, you know, tends to serve the higher end of the market. And, you know, how um, we haven't had a lot of development of, you know, sort of houses in Amherst. It's mostly been, you know, rentals for kind of the higher end of the market. That's where, that's my concern. So as John and I have discussed, um, you know, we're looking at what other university and college towns have done to try and protect some of the housing, you know, for the year round residents. And part of the goal would be to main, to expand and sustain our, our population of families, you know, and year round permanent, however you want to non-student households. But um, 
So that's, so there's the general goals that the, you know, Community Resources Committee is looking at. And then of course I've shared a little of my personal perspective, which is, you know, um, but I think we all, we all um, want to get to more housing for everyone in the community and it's how we get there. I'll just share a little bit of my perspective. One of the things that Paul said to us a meeting or two ago, I can't remember exactly when, is that we don't want to make students the enemy. And I think that's a very important point. Um, students are very important to this community, but even more significant, students are also people and they're getting very often the short end of this stick. Um, you know, there are at least three things that I've seen in the last year or two that indicate that students have to go a long way from Amherst in order to find affordable housing. Um, you know, we're talking about going to Springfield or Holyoke or occasionally even further south. Um, there's at least some anecdotal evidence for that. Uh, and uh, uh, so I don't think the university is serving its students very well, whether we're talking about undergraduates or also when the university talks about students, somehow the fact that there are graduate students and students with families seems to me to get swept under the rug or doesn't get adequate attention. So one of my personal beliefs is that the university needs to find a way of doing more on campus. I understand that there are financing barriers to do that, but it's possible to overcome them. It really needs to be a priority for the chancellor and others, at least on the Amherst campus, if not in the UMass system overall. Um, and Amherst may be worse off, but I, I wouldn't surprise me at all to learn that other UMass communities are experiencing the same kind of housing pressures where they're increasing in numbers of students who are enrolled and less and less local housing to fill the need. So I really do hope that town council takes that up with the university. I think it's very important. The other thing I've mentioned, and I did send this to Jennifer and to Pam Rooney and to our planning department. I saw a piece, I think it was in the Washington Post about homeowner associations in a couple of communities in the South who are banding together and essentially restricting the right of people who buy into homes in those communities from being able to rent them for at least a year or two years after they're purchased. I mean, imagine the disincentive that would create in Amherst if uh, LLCs or private corporations coming in to invest, quote unquote, in Amherst could not actually rent the single family houses that they purchased for at least a year or two. I'm sure there'll be objections to that. Um, but I think it's at least it's something that is worth exploring. Uh, so again, from my personal point of view, I would like to see more restrictions on what owners can do with their homes, particularly initially after their permit purchased. It wouldn't affect existing homeowners. And also in urging the university to do more development on campus. Uh, I'll just say one other thing related to the latter. Uh, the governor has made it important or uh, he has asked state agencies to look at their property and whether there are opportunities for housing development on state property. I talked to someone at DHCD who's involved in this and I said, well, what about university properties? And she said, well, they're not on my list. Nobody's asked me to look at those. So once again, I think there's an opportunity there and it would be great if the state, uh, statewide as well as in Amherst would look at those opportunities and take them seriously. Because if we had 300, uh, sorry, 3,000 to 5,000 new units on the UMass campus, that would really make many more uh, housing units available to families and individuals in Amherst than we have now. 
And I did want to add, I think, you know, we can now, um, you know, allow the last council did this, which was a, you know, terrific, um, you know, change uh, and policy that you can uh, build accessible dwelling units, you know, by right. And the, part of the requirement is that the owner live in either the primary accessor, uh, or accessory unit. So it makes it more affordable if someone wanted to, you know, convert a garage or, you know, build an accessory unit if you were, you know, retired, you didn't, your kids had grown, you could move it to that unit and rent out the primary unit. So it creates more unit, but it also keeps the owners there who have, you know, an investment in the, in the neighborhood and the community. And it's not an absent, you know, it's not a speculative arrangement. So um, I think looking at more of, of that is also a good thing. Yeah, that would be great. That's been available for some time. The question is, how do we encourage people who own property to take that direction? It, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the change just happened last year that Jennifer mentioned. So something that was just, you know, the accessory dwelling unit bylaw was updated last year um, through staff. So I think, you know, I was gonna say that, um, you know, the town council adopted a comprehensive housing policy. It's available on the website under town council. They have town um, town policies and it's it's there. I think it's a really good document. And then at the end, it lists about 50 strategies to try to help achieve the policy. And so, you know, Jennifer outlined a few in terms of like low to medium density types of housing. Um, you know, the planning staff has come up with a list. Uh, you know, it takes a while to get a zoning measure changed. So zoning is a really powerful local tool but it does take a while to change. And so we had looked at um, changing, uh, it's footnote M, and it sounds like something really small, right? It's a footnote M, <laughs> but what it would allow is a lot more dwelling units on a property. And you know, once you started assessing that, you realized um, there weren't any conditions or um, ability to regulate once you, if you could waive that, how many units could go on a property, right? So all of a sudden the impact of neighborhood, neighborhoods could be huge. Um, and so you have to be really careful about how you make a, a zoning change, even if it's to a footnote, right? So you have to have standards and conditions to uh, regulate it because as Jennifer said, the market will, will seek the highest and best use, which is usually uh, you know, as many units as they could put on a property with the dimensional regulations and zoning. And so um, you know, we've discussed having you know, a triplex unit definition, maybe a four unit type of definition and then this tiered level of apartments with standards and conditions to allow them in certain zoning districts or neighborhoods. So right now an apartment building can only be 24 units or less in one building. You could have multiple buildings on a property. Um, and then there are some conditions in the bylaw, but they're allowed in some districts and not in others. But if we had different you know, unit sizes that were allowed or different types of townhouses, they could be allowed in different districts. And so it becomes a pretty complicated um, zoning measures, but we want to be, you know, kind of really judicious and careful in how we, we do that because, you know, if you just say, let's just allow apartments everywhere without certain standards or conditions, you, you could get, um, you know, buildings that aren't really appropriate for certain neighborhoods. And so, um, you know, anyways, I, I was just encouraged the, the, the trust to look at the housing policy and then the strategies. And it's something we could talk about too. You know, there's a number of them listed. What do we think um, are ones that could be taken in the near term? Um, you know, right now planning department is working on six zoning amendments that are things that some of them need to be done, uh, like new floodplain bylaws. And there's some that are, you know, we're, have been working on since last year. So, you know, we have about six right now. And if we, you know, that's, that's going to take the rest of this year. So, you know, if you say, <laughs> let's have five zoning strategies for housing, that's, you know, that's, you know, nine months of work, right. Or, you know, it's a, it's an amount of time to actually, thoughtfully go through certain zoning amendments. So I think it is important though, to prioritize them um, and discuss yes, what we're looking for. I mean, again, this is my, my, my personal um, concern, but um, yes, I, I think, you know, and it's, it's not that people, you know, don't want students are an integral part of our community. I live in a general residence district. I'm three blocks from the university. so. You know, we have many students that, you know, we're a, a very, a neighborhood with, you know, uh, we go from, you know, students to retirees, but um, the concern is the pricing by the bedroom, which 
is expensive for the students and it also then you know makes it more out of reach to the community so the um you know the temptation is as you allow for more densification and more building you know how much of that building will be accessible to all of us you know who if it's priced a thousand dollars a bedroom it's it's out of reach can i can i ask household. a question yeah I sure ask ashley go ahead so um i don't know what this is pertain i mean is there a particular guideline for how much square footage like each you know one bedroom or or a studio has to have because these two new buildings they only have one bedrooms but don't you think that if we also at some point made lots of studios students would also like those and they would also be well fairly affordable well so there's a new building on the corner of uh, university drive south south and um route nine it's under construction right now you know where snell street um you know in that area and it's um I forget actually how many units it is but they're all studios and they're you know um I'm maybe like 270 to 350 square feet. They're small, but you know, I'm hearing that they're going to rent to between like 1700 and 1900 for a studio. And so oh, that's, that's um, like not even a living room. <laughs> like, so, wow. Yeah. I mean, so I think the, it's just, you know, I, in, you know, so I think there is an imbalance in the demand and what people are willing to pay. And some of them might be, well, you know, to get a nice, um, room on campus might be, you know, 1500 a month anyways, right? If you're living in a, a suite on campus, I don't know, but I, I know a few years ago, even living in Southwest, it was about 700 a month. And that's sharing um, your dorm room with someone else, right? That's, and then with a meal plan. And so it may be that for a family for one year, 1700 a month is, it's more than living on campus, but it's not, you know, if it's a few hundred more a month, it's really not exorbitant for a family if they're spending that much on camp, on, on a college, uh, tuition, but for anyone else, it's it's really high. And so, um, you know, we zoning doesn't necessarily control that. We don't control the what a, what someone will charge. So we can try to regulate site design and number of units and other things. But if someone is willing to put studios in at 250 square feet and charge whatever they can get, that's that's something that's really difficult to regulate through through land use regulations. Um, you know, we have inclusionary zoning now, so a certain percent of those will be affordable. Um, but, you know, it's really hard to say, property owner, please charge 1200 a month. I mean, there's certain ways to try to buy down units or do certain things, but it becomes very expensive to do that. Um, okay, interesting. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, there used to be more boarding houses in town, you know, 50, 60 <laughs> years ago, right? There used to, used to be a wider variety of housing types. And that's been lost over the years, right? I mean, it's even statewide, nationwide. But if, you know, if, if there were more, you know, different types of housing, perhaps even more, you know, studios and smaller one bedrooms, that might really help alleviate some pressure. But it's not, you know, it's something to consider. We're a long way from adding 17,000 new units at under $500 a month for rent. No kidding. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> that's the goal, right? I mean, well, ultimately. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what the Wayfinders uh, UMass Donahue Institute proposed. I don't know if anybody has suggested that's a state goal. Carol? I just, I guess that one of the things that seems most promising to me is the inclusionary zoning stuff, because then at least if somebody builds that building, with all those things that cost that much, a certain percentage of them have to be affordable. You can't control what somebody's going to charge for some of the units, but you can put into zoning regulations, I think, that if you do this, then you must also do this and have some of the units be affordable. And it seems to me then at least you get some affordable units instead of only these things that are high priced. So. I, I can't remember exactly right now where all that inclusionary stuff is. It, I think it seemed to me the last time I looked at it, like it was, so why don't you do it in more places than it's being done in? But I, I honestly can't remember. But in a, because of the fact that you can't control the price, that particular approach seems um, seems like a good one to me. And, at, and the one Jennifer said about the accessory dwelling unit, you can only do this in your place if one of them is out occupied by the owner, 
that also seems like something that is has some amount of control over what's happening. Part of the problem is, and again, I'm not a, certainly opposed to inclusionary zoning, but how do we bring it to scale? How do we really increase the number of affordable units that are available when mostly we're talking about doing it in increments of two or three units here and there? Pretty tough. Agreed, but at least that's some. Otherwise, yeah. you have no units here or there. So, <laughs> Agreed, Carol. Agreed. <laughs> Okay, John any was other... saying, I was just going to say that's part of the pressure on purchasing the single family homes is that you can rent them for so much money. Yep. Yeah. If the if the um luxury tax that's a moves question. forward and happens, is there a way that you can like slip in an LLC tax as well? <laughs> That's an interesting I mean, I'm, question. I'm kind of being facetious, but I'm also kind of thinking like, you see all these things that are turning from, you know, sold by a person to an LLC. And it seems like that might be a place to tack into something if, if uh, the doors are open to this luxury tax. Well, the LLC, to the extent that they buy houses or mm -hmm. property would be subject to that, I believe. But I don't think there's any special provision for LLCs at the statute that's being considered. Um, but I could check. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, mean, I think there has to be some creative ideas like that. Like, you know, Northampton is trying to petition the state to, um, you know, be able to uh, um, not even waive, but just deny finder's fees. Um, you know, so right now, I mean, it is it's surprising, but you know, Massachusetts allows someone to charge you up to a, run, a month's rent to find a unit. And now really with the internet and just the way, you know, it works, you, they're really not doing the same type of thing they were when they're actually going out showing units every day and really maybe some are, but you know, anyways, it's hard to think that someone may need to put down basically five months worth of rent to get into a unit um, between first last security and then this finder's fee. So um, there has to be some solution uh, it's probably a number of things that would work. Um, and as you were talking, I had an I, I was going to say something, I've forgotten it, but um, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it is interesting. I feel like there has to be a few creative solutions to that would have to work. Um, Inclusion well, zoning, I, Carol, I, is, you I know, have, 12, if it's a big unit, it's 12% of the unit. So it does, you know, I think depending on you know, I said previously, there could be about 20 new affordable units this year, uh, this in a year with inclusionary zoning, and it may actually be more, it might actually be closer to 25. But, you know, I, I agree it in some, some developments, it's one or two units, but right, I mean, I, I think, right, so wow, in a year, we might have 25 affordable units, you know, deed restricted affordable units. And if development continues at that pace, if we have 25 over a few years, all of a sudden, we have, you know, 50 affordable units. And, you know, it's not, you know, it's not the 1700, but I think, you know, we're making some really good strides to, to have that be, you know, part of almost every housing development now. I was, I just wanted to mention that um, I, you know, if there's a, there is a marijuana tax, like, but the, does the state get it? How does the marijuana tax work for Amherst town in particular, getting the money from the um, dispensaries? Well, the, the, the state tax is twofold. A part of the money goes to the state treasury and then towns can elect to do a fee, if I understand it correctly, that would be something close to what the state collects from the dispensaries. And I believe that Amherst now probably is already collecting those taxes. Paul can answer that question better than I can. Yes, that's true. We are collecting taxes and fees and uh, none have been allocated uh, for anything in particular. They have to be, the fees have to be dedicated to impacts that the town may experience as a result of um, uh, the marijuana industry uh, putting up retail establishments here. And I just want to note that I need to sign off at nine. So I just want to make sure we're on time for our things. Yeah, I think we should be. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Sid disappeared. Um, yeah, yeah, he had an I, 8.30 meeting. 
Yeah, I remember I was going to say that, um, yeah, I mean, the pendulum has swung, I think, where LLCs are buying single family homes and maybe even, you know, duplexes. So, you know, we're Valley CDCs uh, trying to administer a first time home buyer program. The Amherst Community Land Trust is also trying to have some uh, home ownership units. Um, but I know Valley, we've been, I've been in uh, communication with them. They're having, you know, home buyers, you know, um, really stretch their limits, you know, up to almost 350,000 and they're getting out bid, you know, cash offers. Um, you know, after one showing, you know, a dozen cash offers well above asking by, you know, investors. And so you know, it may have been five years ago, we did a comprehensive housing market uh, study. And they said at the time, it does, it does change, right? It shifts. Sometimes home buyers can get in and sometimes investors uh, get in. And so right now, uh, investors are, are winning the day. And um, it, it is, you know, it, it becomes a really challenging um, problem because, you know, we're providing a fair amount of subsidy for these home buyers, but they still are having difficulty competing, um, you know, because they have to go through financing. They just, it's just, they don't have, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I was like, do you, does this really happen? Do they really get cash? And Valley's like, actually, yes, there's a, we had a house at like 335. We, uh, we know the, it seemed like they were interested in our buyer. And then the next day someone came in literally with cash at like 350 and it was gone. I'm like, okay. I mean, I, you hear it, but uh, you know, like it happened. <laughs> it really did. I'm like, wow, that's just like, okay. I mean, how do you compete with that? Um, it's a really difficult thing. Okay. I think we should move a little bit further along on the agenda. We're doing really quite well. There were a couple of items, uh, three items at least for updates. Um, one, I was going to ask Nate to tell us where we are with Strong Street. I know he's been working with Rob Mora and trying to make some progress on uh, our capacity to see development there for home ownership. Yeah, so we looked at Strong Street, maybe it was just last, last month and you know previous months, and the town has about 13 acres um, close to Northeast Street on Strong Street. It's It's a wooded site, it's a pretty steep hillside. Uh, and there's natural, um, there's priority habitat for natural and endangered species. And it, it um, so, um, you know, really we have to decide what can happen there. And so uh, we came up with a concept plan of, I think it was about 16 units on the site with some impacts to the natural heritage area. And we've submitted it to the state and they've, um, just this week, they've, they've done it as a pre-construction filing and we're meeting next week, next week with an engineer and a botanist uh, and, and a biologist. And so we're trying to determine if, if we can have impacts in this area. And so it's actually a pretty rare plant and maybe uh, uh, you know, another insect or some other creature. And so they're really concerned about it. And so they're, they haven't said no, but they're just determining how much of an impact we can have because most of the site is in this, this priority habitat. Um, you know, Eversource did some line clearing in this area and they had to replicate um, habitat. They had to pay money. It was a, you know, pretty expensive for them to even fix the power line. So it's a little bit of a challenge, but the state seems pretty willing to work with us. I'm, I'm actually really pleased with it that they, you know, they didn't say no at the concept development of, you know, 16 units. So uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, it's something that could move forward. Um, it's not a large, you know, it's not a large, um, project, but we're looking at, you know, eight duplexes, all home ownership again. And so, yeah, I, I don't know, John, I, I think next month, hopefully we'll have, you know, keep moving forward enough that, you know, if, if, if the state says sure, maybe we're going to then have to do a little bit more due diligence and have someone come out on site and do some on the ground survey work for this, these habit, you know, these species, um, we'd have to refine the concept plan a little bit, but, you know, we're, um, I don't know, I'm, Kind of optimistic that they'll say okay that's great i appreciate that i mean it sounds like a lot of acres but obviously there's a lot of limitations to what we can do on this site and right. uh at this point i'd be really happy if we could put up 16 affordable units uh home ownership units on that site mm -hmm. uh i was gonna uh i was gonna mention the East Gables project, which is Valley Community Development Project at 132 Northampton Road. Uh, presumably with everybody else, they're fighting the 
traffic on that segment of Route 9 in order to get trucks and other equipment in, but they have actually broken ground. Uh, and so they are starting the development of what will be 28 uh, studio apartments uh, at the so-called, well, I shouldn't say so-called, at the now renamed Eat Gable site, uh, just off uh, Belchertown Road near the center of town. So that's good news. Uh, Laura was with us earlier, but I don't think she's here anymore. So I think that'll be our report on this for tonight. Um, the other thing I was gonna mention, and if people have questions about them, I can try to respond to it. I did note earlier that we are in the midst of doing a, an adult community survey as part of the age and dementia friendly community project that the town is collaborating with uh, uh, the Valley, uh, Valley, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on. Um, the intention is to develop a plan, a plan to make the town more age and dementia friendly. And uh, people in the planning department are working on it. Haley Bolton, who's the new director of the Amherst Senior Center is working on it, as is the Council on Aging and other folks in town. Uh, one of the things that we're contributing is some work on uh, getting the survey accomplished. Uh, the Housing Trust funded uh, a mailed survey. We initially mailed uh, about 500 people. Um, we got at this point over 200 returns and we're climbing toward 250. We did a first wave and then a second wave and returns are still dribbling in uh, two or three a day. And so I'm optimistic that before the end of the month, we'll have a 50% return weight on two waves, which will give us a pretty reasonable sample of individuals in Amherst. We have done a major job in supplementing that sample in a number of ways. There are what I would call convenience surveys, that is surveys available for people to pick up at the Jones Library, at the Bang Center, including the Meals on Wheels program at the Bang Center. Uh, Sid's no longer here, but he and I have been leading an outreach effort to try to make sure that communities of color are better represented than they would be by uh, the mailed survey alone. As of the last count, we had about 73 older adults from the communities of color in Amherst who had responded to the survey, um, which was about double the number we had three or four weeks ago. And again, by the end of April, I'm hoping we won't double again, but maybe we'll get closer to 100. So we have reasonably reasonable representation from those communities. So we're doing a lot. And I think we're going to end up, as I said, with data that is reasonably representative of the community and hopefully providing uh, information that's useful for planning for housing for older adults, for social and health services for older adults, and for other needs that the community has, including potentially a new senior center. I know there's a lot on the town's plate, but um, for folks who keep up with that and look at the comparison between Amherst and Hadley, South Hadley, Northampton, and so forth. Those communities have really done a very nice job at developing senior centers, and Amherst is really lagging behind. And so I'm hoping that's one of the outcomes of this age and dementia friendly project. So, questions about that? Okay. Um, I had some notes on legislative advocacy from CHAPA, but I will put those in the mail. The one thing I will say from that, which is kind of interesting, is that on the one hand, the legislature proposed and the governor assigned a budget supplement of $100 million for uh, emergency supplemental income 
However, the <clears throat> filing deadline for asking for those funds for individual households ends tomorrow, and the state will not be uh, accepting any new applications at least until the beginning of the next fiscal year, which is July 1. And as you might imagine, uh, the advocacy community is up in arms about that because there still are many families that are at risk of being evicted and that need these funds in order to protect themselves. So that's the one thing I'll mention from the CHAPA uh, report. Uh, it's also something that's been highlighted uh, by the Pioneer Valley Network for Planning Hopeless, Homelessness, Preventing Homelessness, led by Pamela Schwartz. So I think those are all the things that I had on our agenda. Are there any further comments or questions? Okay, we are still looking for a new chair and that among other things will be on our agenda for the next meeting. Uh, Dave Zomack will return and we'll talk about uses of ARPA funding for affordable housing in Amherst as well. Carol? Do we have somebody like we, the person who takes the notes or the whatever, the assistant person who left and we, are we still gonna get a new one of that or are you taking the notes or what's happening? I've kind of been taking the notes and trying to produce uh, minutes myself. It's a little hard to do and running yeah, the meeting. Really? Um, so we have to figure out what to do. Uh, Nate and Rita and I have talked about hiring a new person. There are some new barriers to doing that, that we need to figure out how to overcome before we can do that successfully. It's no longer as simple a matter as it once was to hire a part-time person, even at a few hours a week. Um, given the state requirements for whether it's uh, local communities or really private industry as well in hiring part-time people. Yeah, I think there's a, you know, there's, there's been a, through town audits, there's, you know, I, a lot of municipalities, you know, may consider someone an employer or a contractor. And that, that's a, it's a big distinction in terms of taxes and other things. So that's something that's happening with uh, what, you know, what Lucia had been doing. So the easiest way is to have a volunteer, <laughs> someone who just really likes to attend trust meetings, who's not a trust member and just really wants to take minutes. Um, so yeah, John Reed and I met the other week and we're trying to figure out how best to move it forward. And so um, we hope to have someone, you know, helping the trust. Uh, there's also, you know, there's a transcript and this uh, is recorded. So this does become available. We still have to keep minutes, but um, you, know, at, you know, the meeting is posted online uh, you know, every every Friday, IT now uploads all the videos from boards and committees online to the to the town's YouTube channel, so it's readily available. But yeah, John's been doing a lot of work. You know, I've been trying to help, um, but it really is it is a big task to have um, to run a meeting and take minutes. So we're yeah, to that's out. crazy. Yeah, I should add one other thing. Um, last time we talked about the possibility of changing the evenings for these meetings. Um, subsequent to that, I've talked to Paul or emailed with him, and for the moment, he's fine with Thursday evenings, so we're going to stick with that until it becomes a problem, and then we'll look at changing it again. If we hadn't stayed with Thursday, the obvious alternative was Tuesday, given everybody's schedules, but we're not going to do that, at least not now. Just to clarify, it's when there's a council meeting or a council committee meeting, that's a, my priority on those evenings. So if there's not a conflict, I'll be here, obviously. Okay, thanks, Paul. John, there's a hand raised. I don't see it. So would you call on the person? Sure, yeah. George, you can uh, unmute yourself. That was an interesting comment, Nate, about people who like to attend housing trust meetings who are uh, not members of the housing trust. I'm sure that wasn't aimed at anyone in the audience, um, but one of the um, uh, pleasures of being uh, removed from the council is that I can now attend housing trust meetings. And I actually would consider myself in the category of people who actually enjoy attending housing trust meetings. And 
admire the work that the Housing Trust does. So perhaps I'll reach out to you or to John at some point and see if I might be able to provide that service because my intention is to try and attend if I can because you're doing important work and the issues as we saw tonight are very complicated. Um, so having said that and made that planted that seed, we'll see where it goes, maybe nowhere. I'm actually going to make two brief comments, if I may, which may uh, remove me from the consideration for this job. <laughs> I want to push back a little bit on uh, Nate's comment about um, speculators, and it's something that was kind of going through the meeting tonight. I actually have been spending a lot of time trying to understand this market, and I I'm not saying that Nate's wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure who's right or who's wrong here, but the realtors I talk to actually right now are saying that it's going the other direction. Um, given the high cost of homes, um, while there certainly are probably cases of individual speculators, um, there's actually fair evidence that suggests that the market is going the other direction. Um, and I'm just trying to get some data. Um, so I think people should be a little cautious about making generalizations about the speculator market and how people are coming in and gobbling up uh, single family homes uh, and that this is getting worse and worse. It's, I don't have any evidence of that. Um, there may fa in fact be it, and I hope we can, I can find it or someone can find it. But anyway, I'd like to just push back a little bit on that because when I do my research and I look at these evil LLCs, a lot of them actually are local people. Um, and some of them, a lot of these cases also are people who lived in a house for years and then they downsized or moved and they still kept the house and it just provides them an income. Um, so it, it's a complicated story. I, I just get a little nervous when, um, and I'm not accusing Nate of this because I hear it in other quarters as well, that sort of like it's, it's the speculators. Um, that may be true, but I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And I'm, I'm hoping to maybe, well, we'll see, but that's number one. Number two, um, I just noticed that Aspen Heights has five vacancies for affordable housing, and that's up on the town website. And I, that just kind of struck me and I just wondered about it. Maybe there's not time to talk about it tonight. And maybe that's just normal. This happens every so often, but five vacancies in one site uh, seemed a, a large number. And so I just kind of wondered what was going on there. And it, it led to something else that over the, you know, my three years, the one thing that I really wanted with the inclusionary zoning bylaw was some way we could get a report occasionally about how effective it is um, and how it's working and how it's not. And, and Nate spoke about that at the time, and he made it clear that, look, um, you know, once this, you know, a, 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 an entity, uh, you know, is, is renting out these, these, uh, these uh, rooms or whatever, um, the, the whole process is run by somebody else. It's not, the town has nothing to do with it. So maybe it's just not possible um, to get a report or sort of, a, a, you know, where, how effective is this? Um, and, and is this inclusionary zoning bylaw working? Uh, are we reaching the people we want to reach? Um, and that was just, uh, in my mind, it was is ticked off by hearing that Aspen Heights currently has five vacancies for affordable units in the Aspen Heights project. So anyway, that's that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. Uh, you know, I haven't looked into Aspen Heights per se, but I do know that Elsewhere, when we define affordable units that we think will be reachable by families or individuals, these days we're looking for 60% area median income. And Ask, Aspen Heights is working at 80% area median income. So it may be that uh, there aren't enough people that fit that. I really don't know, but I know that's a possible explanation. So yeah, isn't it just... Uh, George, yeah, thanks for your comments. Uh, Risha uh, put in the text that she had to leave. Um, I think Paul's going to uh, leave soon too. Yeah, in terms of the um, investors buying properties, I, I said for I meant I said first time home buyers, and I guess I should qualify that. You know, there's a you know say it's two fifty to three fifty, right? There's an income range or price range where that's happening. Whether that's true for all single family homes or market rate units, that's I don't know. But when the, the comprehensive housing market study from 2015 did say there's a price point at which there's more competition, and so what? So what I, I was just relaying my experience with the first-time homebuyer program. We're trying to help out, and there's you know a narrow income range and home home value, uh, and there's competition there. Um, for Aspen Heights, yeah, I think you know I think the pandemic may have played a role. I think John's right in terms of um, income. So you know if if they're priced at eighty percent AMI, it's actually above what a voucher program can. Um, can actually provide an AMR. So it's, in, you know, anyone with a, a Section 8 voucher can um, get into a unit at 80% AMI. Uh, so sometimes 
a developer will voluntarily lower the affordable unit, you know, the rate, um, just so they can um, accept a voucher uh, holder. I, I, in terms of the pandemic, I think what what happened was, you know, they had a fair number of applications. Actually, they went through the lottery, and then after the lottery, you still have to complete an application screening, right? Whether that's income verification or other steps. And it seems like a lot of um, applicants didn't follow through with that step, and so my thought was that maybe they became underemployed or unemployed and they couldn't meet a minimum income to get into units or you know just something with the last year and a half it, there's some difficulty in the situation that they didn't follow through and complete the application and they didn't get into the unit so uh the the, the firm that's doing it seb housing is actually pretty well respected and they're a big company from eastern mass and so um you know they they reached out and asked if we could help advertise again um, you know, I, I haven't followed up, you know, I did ask and they had some explanation, but not too many details about why they, there are, um, vacancies. So I think it's probably a number of factors and yeah, I think it's something to watch, right? So as we have more, uh, units through inclusionary zoning, we can try to have, you know, some type of assessment, you know, some type of follow-up data in terms of how well were they, um, you know, occupied. So I think typically we get a fair number of applicants, but it's, it's then that additional screening to get them into the units. So we usually put a local preference on them. So 70% local preference. So, you know, at the initial lottery and lease up, it's for you know, people with school age children who work in Amherst, who currently live in Amherst. We're trying to, you know, we do that. Um, and then there's a general applicant pool. And typically we have a fair number of applications for every, for, you know, three times as many applicants as the number of units. And then it's always somehow there's a barrier between number of applications and actually getting into the unit. So it's something we can look at, look at in the future. Yeah, I know there was no trouble renting up the North Square units that were affordable, but those were lower than 80% area median income. Well, well, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say that. I think, you know, All right. so okay. they, you know, like I said, so at initial lease up and lottery, you know, there's um, 26 units. And then as through the application screening process, a number of applicants were either denied or they didn't follow through. And so they ended up working down the list quite a bit. Um, it's just, you know, um, so even though you initially, they can say, oh, we have 26 units occupied or 26 tenants selected. Oftentimes, you know, you go through a number of tenants. They don't either, they don't submit the paperwork or I don't know what happens, right? And so there's, there could be, um, there is some, you know, that's where the town isn't involved with, right? We're, we can't be involved with that as a permitting entity. So it's through the property management company, the developer possibly, and then the tenants. And so we can recommend that tenants talk to like family outreach to assist them. Mm -hmm. And there could be barriers to that, right? There could be some, some disconnect in the process. Uh, and so, you know, it, you know, it, and it might be happening, you know, statewide as well, right? Not just in Amherst, that's just somehow there's this disconnect. So you know, if we hear about it, we always try to help out. Um, and maybe it becomes a bigger systemic problem. Like what is, you know, what, why is it that the initial tenants can't get into the units? I don't know. Okay. Thanks, Nate. I think we're at nine o'clock. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, is there any discussion of the motion? Then I will ask all those in favor, just say aye. Aye. And aye. aye. Thank you all. I think this has been a very interesting meeting and I appreciate everybody's participation. See Thank you next you. month.